read a book a month, lose 10 pounds, quit social media. What are your New Year's resolutions this year? It seems like the uh, whole idea of making resolutions has kind of gone out of style a little bit in the recent years. Uh, like, so it's just kind of fell short of our goals and keeping our commitments, so we just stopped setting them all together, setting ourselves up for failure. But it's a very biblical idea, actually, and there's whole sections of uh, scripture, Old Testament law in particular, outlining instructions for taking oaths, for making pledges before God. And <clears throat> even in the New Testament, when Jesus commands us not to swear oaths anymore, but to simply let your yes be yes and your no be no, you notice that his instructing us in that presupposes that we're still making commitments. We're saying yes to the gym and no to fast food. And we just don't need to swear by God's throne on it anymore. So this idea of pausing to take stock of our lives and examine our hearts, recalibrate our routines, resolving to, to be more intentional going forward, that's all a very good godly endeavor not just at New Year's, any time of the year really, but this is an especially appropriate time here at the beginning of the year. And so for these next three weeks, in three weeks I should say, uh, as promised, God willing, we will start our study of the book of Exodus together that should take us the better part of uh, six to eight months to finish, haven't mapped the whole thing out yet. But for these next three weeks to start the new year, I want us to consider together how God might be calling us to resolve, to, to prayerfully uh, commit or recommit our minds and hearts to uh, some worthy pursuits in this year to come. This could easily, of course, be a 10 or 12 week series or more. There's tons of worthy resolutions we could and should consider making, memorizing scripture, keeping a weekly Sabbath rest day, uh, prioritizing disciple making in our relationships, any number of good uh, God-honoring pursuits, but I want to focus on just three this morning, in, or the next three weeks in particular, and there's a reason behind each of these resolutions that I'll be commending to you. So back in August, uh, we asked about 30 of you to take uh, what's called the NCD, the Natural Church uh, Development Survey that helps churches uh, identify their greatest strengths to celebrate, our greatest weaknesses to try and address. And overall, we got very high marks, especially in important categories like loving relationships, uh, gift-based ministry. We scored off the charts on questions like, uh, I know why I come to worship services. And in our church, it's possible to talk with others about personal problems. It's great. Lots to be encouraged by coming out of that survey a few months ago. There was also a few results that troubled uh, some of us in the leadership of the church. Of the 91 questions asked, there were, there, here are the three questions that we scored lowest on as a church. Question 77, times of prayer are an inspiring experience for me. Question 36, our church tries to help those in need, food, clothing, education, counsel, etc., and then question 70, I know a number of individuals in our church who have the gift of evangelism. And so in October, uh, we recruited two church, what's called church strengthening teams, one to try and address our collective um, prayer life here at West Hills, and the other to focus on our, quote, need-oriented evangelism is kind of the category they group that under. And I want to thank uh, take a moment to thank those of you who are serving on one of those teams, and especially uh, to thank Bill and Anna Connick and Terry Weaver for their respective leadership of those two teams. And you'll be hearing more from uh, both of those teams in the weeks and months to come as they continue to meet and discuss and eventually propose a plan of action uh, to us elders for churchwide execution. And uh, on that note, quickly, since we're going to be talking about prayer specifically this morning, uh, I've been asked by the prayer team, they'd, they'd like your help this morning. So if I could get all of you right now, just quickly pull your phones out. We're going to show a slide up here uh, with a QR code. If you have a smartphone and you can pull your camera out and take a picture of the QR code right now, it'll take you to a link to a survey. Those of you who are not technologically inclined are about to have your minds blown by this. But you can literally you know, take a picture of that, a link should pop up, click on it, and it'll redirect you to a 
prayer survey that's going to help our prayer team more uh, accurately diagnose um, what, what is going on in that question on the survey about the prayer life of our folks here at West Hills. That would really help them out. <clears throat> Don't do it now. You can listen to the rest of the sermon. And then after you know, we're done here on your way home, when you get home, just leave it up on your browser, whatever. You'll come back to it. You'll say, oh, I never did that. Fill it out then. But our mission statement here at West Hills is to glorify God by living in community with one another, growing in spiritual maturity as disciples of Jesus, and serving the world missionally with the love of Christ. Okay, so as a church, we have already made our resolutions, not only for the new year, but for every year, for all time, as a church, we are resolved to glorifying God in three ways. By loving Jesus, by loving one another as a church, and by loving those outside the church with the love of Christ. And by God's providence, uh, our NCD results a few months ago just naturally sort of lent themselves to one sermon each in each one of those three big uh, umbrella bucket categories, priorities we have as a church. Because what is prayer really? At its heart, prayer is the means by which we cultivate a love relationship with Jesus. They say that um, the key to a healthy relationship is what? Communication. Right? And if I could just make a quick aside for, a, for an analogy's sake here, speaking of prayer, you can pray for me and Polly right now. Our relationship is not the healthiest it's ever been at the moment. Uh, again, just getting real honest this morning. Um, We've got issues as a church we've got to address, got issues in my marriage, got to address. But what it boils down to is for the past month now, since our son came along, Bo, uh, he's wonderful, but Polly and I have been just kind of in survival mode. You know, we've been like passing ships. We've been like roommates who just happened to share a bed, and that's for just the half of the time that one of us is not out of the bed, feeding him, trying to get him to stop crying. But, you know, that we're not communicating or not connecting like a married couple is supposed to. And I wonder if for so many of us, this analogy doesn't accurately describe our spiritual lives as well. You know, maybe you and God just have kind of felt like passing roommates. The best way to know whether you're just sort of passing ships in the night, roommates who happen to, to sometimes share a bed, so to speak, the best way to know is to take a, a look at your prayer life this morning. Prayer is communicating, it's connecting with God. And if we had more time, I'd, I'd preach a second sermon this week, this week on prayer, next week on scripture, the importance of connecting with God through scripture, because just like any relationship, you know, relationships are a two-way street, right? Prayer is mostly us talking to God, and then when we open the Bible, God's word, we expect to hear him speaking back to us. And so scripture is at least as important. It's at least as important that we, we, we get in, that we stay in scripture, commit to that, to consistently hearing from God in this new year. Get in a discipleship group. Get in a life group. It's not too late. We'll plug you in even after the new year has started now. Get with brothers and sisters who will hold you accountable to being in God's word and to prayer. We've got some great Bible reading plans printed off at the info bar. You can grab one on your way out and commit to that. That's, that's, that's a resolution worth keeping, worth building structures into your life to, to make sure that you don't let it fall by the wayside. But because as a church, we happen to score 35 points higher on the questions about spending time with God in Scripture than we did spending God, time with God in prayer. I want to focus specifically this morning on prayer. And of all the places in the Bible we could go to help, for help in our prayer lives, none is better than Matthew chapter 6. Uh, prayer that is above every prayer, the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray. Most of you are no doubt familiar with the Lord's Prayer. Many of us, I'm sure, have it memorized some six years ago now, I preached a, a four-part mini-sermon series exclusively on the Lord's Prayer, <clears throat> this model prayer. And to be sure, 
It is a model for us. It teaches us how to pray. Jesus says as much as we'll read in just a moment in verse 9. He says, pray then like this. Here's a model. But we could also translate that Greek phrase, pray then along these lines. In other words, pray then for this reason. Pray thusly. And so this morning I want to give you not so much the how of prayer, but the why. And not so much the seven practical how-to tips for re-energizing your prayer life, but the seven reasons why we want to pray as God's people. Because at the end of the day, the determining factor between the resolutions that you will keep, that you will honor and follow through on this year, and the ones that will fall by the wayside is your heart. Same for me. It's our heart. Our hearts always trump our heads, don't they? Now, you can know cognitively that it is in your best interest, long-term interest, to stop by the gym on the way home and spend you know, a quick 20-minute workout at the gym instead of stopping by Taco Bell to spend a quick $20 uh, eating fast food. By the way, that is a lot of Taco Bell. <laughs> Don't do that to yourself. God loves you. Your body is a temple. But here's the thing, the only way that you will choose the weights over putting on weight is if you love and you desire to look and to feel good more than you desire tacos that taste good. It's all about your desires. Ultimately, our priorities are set by our heart's desires. Polly and I could have a great, a thriving, intimate relationship right now. We would just have to want that more than we want a healthy baby. Because the experts, you know, tell us that it's not healthy to let a newborn scream his head off for an hour because we just need some us time. Babies don't understand that, I'm I'm told. So with all that said, I want to spend the rest of our time together reminding you why it is that as God's son, God's daughter, for those of of us who are God's children, why it is that we want to pray, reminding you why this is so good that we get the privilege to pray. If you're a believer, if you're a child of God, then you want to pray. You might not yet want to pray more than you want that extra half hour of sleep. You might not yet want prayer more than you want that half hour alone time with your spouse. You might not yet want it more than you want just that half hour to to unwind and, and, and veg out at the end of the day in front of the screen. But I'm going to try and spend the next half hour trying to convince you, and I'll be honest again, trying to convince me, uh, because I'm chief chief of sinners. When I get, you know, whatever little free time I have left, prayer is not usually the first place I run. So trying to convince myself this morning that we should desire to pray every bit as much as we desire any of those other things and more. And ultimately, all I can do this morning at best, is to convince your heads. Because God is the only one who can change our hearts. God is the only one who can cause us to reorient our desires, our affections, to desire him, relationship with him above all else. And so, with that said, we're, we now need to hear from him, from his word, what he has to say on the matter, and then to go to him in prayer, asking him to do what only he can do and change our hearts. So I invite you to stand with me as you're able <clears throat> for the reading of God's word this morning from Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. Hear the word of the Lord. And Jesus said, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, that you are a connecting God, a God, a God who desires to know and to be known. 
that you speak to us, that you have spoken to us through your word. As we read it and study it, we hear your heart for us. And God, now as we hear from your word and reflect on your word and what it tells us about prayer and about how we respond by communicating with you, connecting with you, expressing our hearts to you, would you do what only you can do? Would you reorient our affections? Would you change our desires? Would you stir our hearts to love you above all else? To desire willingly, voluntarily, eagerly, gratefully to give you our whole hearts, our minds, our souls, our strength. You are deserving of it all. We pray in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> the first reason we want to pray as believers is that prayer reminds us that we have a caring Father who hears us from heaven. All three of these words in Jesus' opening line here point us to a unique truth and an astounding truth about who God is and about what it means to connect with him in prayer. So I'm going to work our way backwards on these three words. First, prayer reminds us that the God we're praying to is in heaven. Our Father in heaven. He, he oversees everything from heaven. When the Bible talks about God's being in heaven, it is to emphasize his absolute sovereign governance and his rule over everything under heaven. Psalm 115.3 says our God is in the heavens, therefore what? He does all that he pleases. Psalm 103.19, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Daniel 4.35, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but God does according to his will among the host of heaven, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? God is absolutely, totally sovereign. And so the first miracle of prayer then is that that same God, the God in heaven who created the heavens and the earth, who rules over all of it, that he cares, that he deigns to care about our prayers. You know, some people don't pray because they think, well, surely God has better things to worry about than my job interview, than my dog's surgery. But Jesus assures us that not a sparrow falls to the ground without God taking notice, that God even cares to number the, the hairs on our head. That's how much he cares about every minute detail of your life. That's why King David was just blown away when he prayed, Oh Lord, when I look at your heavens, at your sovereignty, your bigness, when I look at the, big, the bigness of your work, of your fingers, what is man that you are mindful of him? I'm so small. Why do you care that you care for me? It's astounding. And not only does he care for us, but according to Jesus, he cares for us as, secondly, a father. He cares for us as a father, Abba, Daddy. As your pastor, I care for each and every one of you here. I do. I genuinely do. But if I'm honest again, honesty time, my care for you and my care for my three children are light years apart, like orders of magnitude apart. Sophie's choice, uh, if I had to choose between the 300 plus of, of, of y'all here at West Hills and my three kids, it's not even a contest. I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'll see you in heaven. Say hey to Jesus for me. I'll see you when I get there because I'm not, I'm not ever going to do that to my kids. Brothers and sisters, do we realize this is the, the kind of way that our heavenly Father cares for us with that kind of a zealous, jealous love, an unconditional, unstoppable love. That before Jesus, no one thought of God as their father, much less addressed him as such. God called himself Israel's father some dozen times in the Old Testament, but no human did ever or would have ever thought to call God daddy. We're talking about the omnipotent creator of everything. We're talking about the sovereign sustainer 
of everything. The utterly transcendent God who dwells in unapproachable light. 1 Timothy 6. The, the infinitely eternal God who exists outside of time and space. And according to Jesus, that God is your Papa. At least he can be. And that brings us to our third point of this opening line. First word of Jesus' prayer, our our Father, that not only is God preeminent in heaven, not only is God paternal Father, but God is also personal. He's not just any Father. He's your Father, my Father, our Father. I'll never forget, as a little kid, I always loved going and visiting my dad at his office. He'd let me sometimes do rounds with him, visit his patients, and I loved hearing nurse after nurse tell me how amazing my dad was. Your dad is the best doctor I've ever worked for. Hearing patient after patient tell stories it seemed like every time we would go out to dinner as a family, uh, someone would, would recognize my dad from tables over and come over. My dad rarely remembered them. You know, it was 10, 15 years ago, but they'd you know, come up to shake his hand again, thank him, and then they turn to me and they say, your dad saved my life 15 years ago. And it made me so proud. It blew me away. And what blew me away wasn't just that he was that important and outstanding. It wasn't just that a guy like that could also be a father in the abstract and, and theoretically <laughs> care about his own children, even more than this amazing profession where he got to literally save people's lives. It was that he was my father. It was that he cared about me that much, personally. Brothers and sisters, prayer reminds us that a God infinitely more important and outstanding than my father, than your father, than any earthly father, cares about you personally. This is what prayer does. It reminds us that God loves you, loved you so much so that he sent and sacrificed his only begotten son in order to reconcile you to himself, in order to adopt you into his heavenly family. Why do we pray? Because we have a good, caring Father who invites us to cast your cares on me because I care for you, First Peter 5. It's because we understand what an unbelievable, unmerited privilege it is that we not only have the ear of Almighty God, but that we have his heart as well. This perfect, holy, all-seeing, all-knowing, transcendent, all-powerful, all-ruling God of the universe not only hears us, but that he loves us personally as his own. That's why we pray. And the second reason we pray, number two, is that the same caring Father is also our holy Lord. And Jesus immediately turns from the personal, our Father, to teach us to pray this specifically to him, hallowed be your name. To hallow, not a word we use very often anymore, to hallow is to regard as holy or honor as holy. So we're asking God to make his name, which is already objectively holy in its own right, to cause it to be honored as such by whom? By us. God, help me to honor your holy name. Help me to regard you rightly in all your holiness. And lest we get too comfortable and too casual in our chats with daddy, Let's not forget that he is also a consuming fire. Hebrews 12 tells us that when we do get to Exodus here in a few weeks, we're going to discover that the God who loved his people so much that he personally delivered them from bondage in Egypt is the same God who was so holy that he had to warn them, forbid them from stepping foot on Mount Sinai, lest They'd be struck dead instantly because of their sinfulness and his holiness. And that's not just an Old Testament God. God is the same yesterday, today, forever. And so Jesus is the same Jesus, God in the flesh, 
who love folks that everyone else despised, the tax collectors and prostitutes, so much that it earned them the nickname friend of sinners, that same Jesus also told them to go and sin no more. And he also commands us to treat self-professing fellow Christians who are living in unrepentant sin as Gentiles and tax collectors. Kick them out of the church because we are to be holy as I am holy. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Not my church. No, I won't stand for it. And so we, when we pray, hallowed be your name, we're reminded that because God is our caring Father, he loves us enough to want the very best life possible for us, which is a life free of sin. A holy life. A life that honors him as holy and as Lord. This title, Lord is used of Jesus more than any other in the New Testament, more than Savior, more than Messiah, more than homeboy. You've seen those shirts, Jesus is my homeboy. That's not in the Bible anywhere, but Jesus is your Lord is over 700 times found in the Bible. It's this term, kurios, Lord, is used, adopted from the slave trade, literally means master. Adoption isn't free. We've been through it. Like literally, adoption is expensive. And your adoption, spiritual adoption, cost Jesus the highest price of all. You were bought with his blood, his life, so that we might be a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that we may proclaim the excellences of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, 1 Peter 2. We have been saved to serve we have been freed to follow. And prayer is so important because it reminds us of this. It puts us in our rightful place, that we are not gods unto ourselves. We are not the center of the universe. Prayer recenters us on the one alone who is truly at the center of it all. Hallowed be his name. And it also, number three, reminds us that God is a wise ruler. Verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In our flesh, our hearts naturally cry out, my kingdom come, my will be done. It is only by faith, by a work of the Spirit, supernaturally, that our hearts can genuinely pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and mean it. It is only by faith that we can come to see God's sovereignty, his, his rule, his reign over us, not just as a regrettable reality, but as a glorious gift from a good God. When I first came to faith, I, I don't know about you, your testimony and how this you know, understanding of, God's, of Christ's lordship in your life worked out. I'll just be honest. There was a short period of time when I first came to faith where I almost lamented Christ's lordship. When I was first learning to, to pray thy will instead of my will, but I didn't like it yet. Like there, there was this sense of kind of settled, somber uh, resignation in my heart. Because I hate losing, and I hate quitting. And that's really what Christianity is. It's you losing because Jesus won. Over, he beat you out. He conquered you, your sin, your, old, your fleshly old, old nature. He won. And you finally surrendered. You finally gave in. And let him beat you in the best way as possible. But I, I, my initial surrender, honestly, in my case, was somewhat begrudging. It's like, well, Jesus, I, I guess I've tried life with me being Lord for 27 years, and it's just made me progressively more miserable every year that I've lived that way, and so I guess I'll let you have a, a shot. If you want to think about it in, in business terms, think about it something like a company acquisition. My stock just kept plummeting year after year, uh, and yet despite that, here, here comes along this massive, amazing corporation who inexplicably wants to buy me out, not just for a fair price, fair market value for a far better than fair price, actually for an unfairly generous price. And yet, despite all of that, there was still this short period of time where I can distinctly remember being a bit saddened by the transition in new ownership, the buyout, until, until 
I started to realize, to, to experience the benefits, the perks, the perks like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, until I realized how infinitely better God's plan, God's kingdom, his will for my life was than my own. If God had let me and my will be done, there's no telling where I would be right now. I know it wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be behind a pulpit anywhere. This wasn't my plan. I wouldn't have three kids, beautiful, wonderful kids that I, I willingly lose sleep and hair for. That wasn't, they weren't my plan. That was his plan. My plan would have pro probably landed me face down in a gutter somewhere. Ultimately, my plan would have landed me in hell. That was my plan. Hell was my plan. Who needs God? I'm going to do whatever the hell I want. And that's exactly what I would have gotten. That's where it would have landed me, and rightfully so, but for the grace of God. He is a good, gracious, wise ruler. God knows what he's doing. We can trust him. And prayer reminds us of that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's such a liberating prayer once you understand what kind of a God he is. Because it means we don't have to be the lords of our life. We don't have to be the masters of our own fate. That's a, that's a burden far too big for any of us to carry. Listen, let God be God. You've got enough trouble being a human, much less a God. Don't try and be God on top of it. He's really good at being God. You're not. So let him be, not just begrudgingly, but enthusiastically, gratefully. Number four, prayer reminds us that God is a generous provider. Verse 11 Instructions to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Now, why would we pray that? Because let's be honest, I know, I'm looking around, few visitors I don't know. You look like you, you, you're dressed enough that you ate this morning. Um, I know most of you in this room, and for all of you who I do know, I can say conclusively that you're, you're not living meal to meal, that you, you, you're, not, you're not in a state where you don't know where your next meal is going to come from. And if that were the case, I trust that you would tell me as your pastor and we, we get you help. And so what business do a bunch of people living in the affluent suburbs of the most affluent country, in the most affluent epoch in the history of the world, we are the 1% of the 1% in this room, what business do we have praying, give us this day our daily bread? Well, we pray that for two reasons. First, we pray it to keep our affluence in check. Uh, because you, if you are truly a follower of Jesus, then you can only build your mansion so big. You can only do so many expansions. You can only fill your garage with so many sports cars. Uh, you can only amass so many zeros at the end of your bank account statement and still have the audacity to pray and ask God, give me today's bread. There comes a point where there's, just, there's too much cognitive dissonance there. And so praying this keeps our, our generosity in check. That's why Proverbs 30 teaches us to pray, Lord, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Now, speaking of prayer, when was the last time you prayed that one? God, please don't let me get too rich because I don't want to become so comfortable that I delude myself into thinking that I no longer need you. Have you prayed that lately? You should. We're the 1% of the 1% here. But the second reason we pray give us this day our daily bread is that it reminds us that no matter how much bread we have, and we do have some people here this morning that have different amounts of bread, whether you've got just enough bread for this day or honestly, like most of us, thankfully, we've got more than enough bread to last us many days. Either way, we are reminded that all of it is ultimately the gracious gift of a generous God. That every good gift comes down from the Father above, James 1. Because God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, Psalm 50, verse 10. That means that all of it belongs to him. We're just stewards of his resources to be used for his glory. 
Deuteronomy 8.18 reminds us that even the power to get wealth, the ability to make the money, to go to the store and buy the bread, that ability was a gift given to you by a bountiful God. It's a reminder that because the Lord is our shepherd, therefore we shall not want. Because he is a generous provider. And number five, prayer reminds us that God is also a merciful Savior. Verse 12, if you thought it was convicting that folks as wealthy as us might pray for our daily bread, now just consider how people as unforgiving as we can sometimes be could possibly ask God to forgive us our debts. And Jesus' answer is, we can't. Jesus says clearly right there in the second line, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Jesus instructs us to pray, specifically, God, forgive me to the exact same extent that I have forgiven others. That's how much I want you to forgive me, God. Talk about dangerous prayers. And, and just in case we didn't catch it and we were unclear and we thought, well, maybe he's being hyperbolic, he comes back to this point. Jesus expounds on this line alone of all the lines in the prayer. This is the one he singles out when he's done with the whole prayer and he circles back to. He says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then if we had kept reading verses 14 and 15, say, uh, for if you forgive others their trespasses, he comes back to it. Your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. How can we possibly pray this? Again, two reasons. First, once again, it, it helps keep us in check. If, if praying for our daily bread keeps our affluence in check, praying for forgiveness keeps our own unforgiveness in check. Jesus told this parable once about a servant who owed a king 10,000 talents. One talent was equivalent to 20 years salary for a common laborer in Jesus' day. And so we're talking somewhere in the ballpark of six billion dollars with a B. But incredibly, the king forgave the entire debt, covered, consider it paid, forgiven. But then that same servant went out and tracked down another servant who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, a denarius was a single day's wage for a laborer, so maybe $10,000 today. That's still a sizable debt. I don't know how much, how much bread you're bringing in. That's not chump change for me, $10,000. But nowhere near the 10,000 talents that the servant had owed his master, the king. This guy had been mercifully forgiven a debt 600,000 times greater just the day before. And yet now he refused to forgive the 100 denarii, Jesus asked, what will be done to such a man? And then he answers, in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. I met with uh, one of you just this past week for counseling who, um, she was expressing a really hard time forgiving another family member uh, for something terrible they'd done years ago. And it was bad. I can't, for confidentiality reasons, go into it, obviously, but it was bad. I mean, $10,000 debt, sizable, bad. But I had to gently remind her, the sister, that of the fact that she was drowning under six billion dollars worth of spiritual debt when Jesus, her merciful Savior, so magnanimously saved her, forgave her. Yes, forgiveness is sometimes a process. 
doesn't always happen overnight. No forgiveness doesn't always mean forgetting. Uh, trusting that person again uh, doesn't mean repaired relationship. That's not always possible. But forgiveness is. Forgiveness, the decision not to hold this person's sin against them any longer, not to let them be completely defined by the sum total of their worst decisions and sins. That is a decision that we can make and that we must make according to Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we of all people in the church must be professional forgivers because we understand how much we ourselves have been forgiven. We know personally the crushing weight of debt. We also know the liberating freedom of forgiveness. Our sins, they were indeed many. Too many to number, too many to count, according to Scripture. But Jesus' mercy was indeed more. A marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who simply believe. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sins. Number six, and quickly, prayer also reminds us that God is our guiding deliverer. He's not only a merciful Savior, he's a guiding deliverer. Verse 13, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This same Savior who has now delivered us from past sins by his shed blood on the cross in our place and their rightful penalty, hell and death, also now continues to deliver us from otherwise potential future sins that we would otherwise commit, and their just consequences as well, that God loves us enough not just to get us out of trouble, but to keep us out. And he promises in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that no temptation has overtaken you, but that which is common to man, and God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. God can and will and does deliver us from evil, and he leads us in paths of righteousness for his own name's sake instead, if we will but ask him, and then obediently follow his lead. And here is your final bonus reason that we pray as God's people. It's because God is a worthy claimant. The way that most of us memorized the Lord's Prayer ends with a line that actually only appears in a few of the later New Testament manuscripts, but that is nevertheless undoubtedly uh, true and biblical and worthy of inclusion in the prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Have you ever considered how audacious it is that God not only desires, but that God demands all of our heart, all of our mind, all your soul, your whole strength, all of you. It, God lays claim to every part of us. How can he demand so much, demand it all? It's because he deserves it all. God alone deserves our heart, mind, soul, strength. And according to the book of Revelation, for the rest of eternity, that's what he'll get as we gather around his throne and we cast down our crowns at his feet and we cry forever, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive all glory and honor and power. Friends, why do we pray? I, I've given you the 45-minute version just in case you missed any of it, let me give you the five-second version. We pray to get God. Unbelievers pray when they're in the trenches to get stuff from God. God's children pray at all times without ceasing. God tells us not to get God's stuff, but to receive the greatest treasure of all, which is God himself. He is our caring father. He is our holy Lord. He is our wise ruler. He is our generous provider, our merciful savior, 
our guiding deliverer, and he alone is worthy of every second of every day of the next year and every year to come that we can and will spend talking to him, listening to him, connecting with him, communicating an intimate love relationship with him. He's worthy of all the seconds that we do that and all the seconds that we should and fail to do that. He's worthy of it all. Come to him this morning. Come to him this new year in prayer. I want to leave you with three quick take-home, applicable, let's make this practical take-home questions. Number one, what resolutions is God calling you to this year? Maybe you honestly connected most with the first you know, quarter, third of the sermon before we got to prayer. Maybe it was one of the passing references to rest, Sabbath, or to scripture memorization, even the, the non-spiritual examples of reading or exercising more. Maybe God, God brought to mind uh, possible resolutions that I didn't even mention. I need to start serving at church. I need to start giving to the church. I need to start serving outside church together as a family. Don't miss this opportunity this morning on New Year's to prayerfully take stock of your life, re-examine, recalibrate, and resolve. It's a great opportunity. Number two, which of the seven points that we reviewed about prayer and about why we want to pray, which hit home most with you and why? In what way is God calling you to be more resolute in your prayer life specifically this year? Perhaps you approach God too formally. O eternal, holy, transcendent, almighty, omnipotent being. And maybe God is just going to teach you to simply call him Father this year. And he's going to give you a piece about, about calling him that because he's going to develop that personal relationship with you this year. Perhaps you're guilty of approaching him too flippantly and you need to be, have God's hallowedness impressed upon you this year. You're too casual in your, your sin in approaching God. Perhaps your prayers are, honestly, if you're honest, your prayers are pretty self-centered. They sound more like, my will be done, my kingdom come. Your prayers sound more like what you can get from God. You know, it's like sitting in Santa's lap. That's you in prayer. And maybe you need to repent of that this morning and learn to pray God-centered prayers this year. Lastly, number three, what, what are you going to do practically, tangibly, as you leave here this morning to make sure to resolve that you will not be a hearer of God's word only when it comes to prayer, but that you will be a doer of his word? Maybe this means, i just give you a couple quick examples. Setting an alarm right now to remind yourself tonight, 15 minutes before your usual bedtime, 9.30, 10.15, whatever it is, set an alarm. 15 minutes before you usually be turning it in for sleep, whatever you'd be doing to stop and pray instead. Set two alarms. Set one for the morning as well to wake up 15 minutes before you would normally wake up to start the day in prayer. There's no better way to start the day. Maybe it's having a conversation on the ride home to, together uh, this morning as a, as a couple, as a family, about what you want new rhythms of prayer to look like in your life, in your family's life this year. Maybe it's, maybe it's less about how much God wants you to pray, and more about how he wants you to pray. I had Kelly Hinderlong remind me in between services about, you know, just how encouraged she was. Her discipleship group last year went through that, that free book that we gave away last year, Praying the Bible. Wonderful book. I don't know if we still have any extra leftover free copies, but wonderful book. That would be such a, a, a great rhythm to get in this year of shaping your prayer life quality over quantity. A couple years ago, pastor uh, in a book I was reading suggested praying out loud, a very practical thing. Helps focus your, your mind and your heart more as you're praying exclusively on God. I've been doing that ever since. Super helpful. Uh, around the same time, I was convicted of the fact, I don't know, maybe some of you can resonate with this as well, of how often I was telling people all the time, I'll pray for you. You know, people would share something going on in their life, I'll pray for you. And how many times I would walk away, and, and it, just as soon as I walked away, it was in one ear and out the other. And I never prayed for them. I just lied to them, you know. And worse, I, I, they needed prayer, and I didn't do it. And so I, I got convicted about this and just decided, you know what, instead, I, the five seconds that I would have spent telling them that I'm going to pray, I'm just going to pray for them. Even if it's a quick five-second prayer, I'm, can I pray for you? 
uh, right now in the, the lobby of the church, pull them aside, pray. Right now, before I let you off the phone, thank you for calling to let me know. But can I pray with you right now in real time? It's just practical rhythms of, of how we can pray maybe more effectively. Maybe God is calling some of you this morning to be more missional in your prayers as you think about loved ones in your life who are lost, who don't know the Lord, and who need your prayers. Again, only God can change their hearts. You can't. But what you can do is pray that God would. God tells, tells us he hears those prayers and he honors them. And maybe some of you last year started this 1-8 prayer initiative with us, fasting and praying on the 18th of every month for those folks, and you need to continue that in the new year. Maybe some of you are resolving to share the gospel more this year. I want to be more evangelistic. We'll talk about that more in two weeks, need-oriented evangelism. Prayer can be an amazing tool in your evangelism. If you want to be committed, resolute, to sharing the gospel more in the year to come, you can just start by asking everyone you meet, how can I pray for you? How can I pray for you right now? Your server at lunch that you go, you got to lunch today, just ask him, how can I pray for you? Your em employee at work tomorrow, you go into the office, hey, how can I pray for you this, this new year? And just see what kind of doors God opens for opportunities to witness spiritual conversations. The possibilities are endless, but our time together this morning is not. And so I want to end now the same way we began and the same way we should end and begin every day in every worship service in prayer together. Let's close.